was sitting at the airport uh, for quite some time. But truly speaking, I never thought even once that I won't come. Uh, it didn't matter uh, how long it took, but I was certainly going to come here. Uh, and I must thank uh, Dr. Alka. I mean, I have been calling her up continuously since morning and updating her. I don't know whether she wanted the updates, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I must at least uh, let her know. Uh, I think the Nagpur Society is a fantastic society. I think it's a great example of how a society can punch above its weight. And uh, it has proven this uh, every year and this year also is no different. To join the, to please join the which is the basis of the systematic categorization. 
I just find this classification much easier to use. Not only do I find it easier to use, I find that using this chart actually helps me in my diagnosis and also management because I come to know when I look at this chart exactly what I'm dealing with and because I know what I'm dealing with, I can then plan the whole thing much better. The other good thing about the SA classification compared to the ASRM classification is that it talks about the cervix and the vagina septic. The ASRM classification that way is a bit of a hodgepodge classification because it you know it sort of clubs everything together and then when you have situations where the uterus is normal and the vagina is abnormal, you really get into a mess with the ASRM classification. And that's why I prefer the SJSC classification. These two papers are easily available. If you go up to SA and do a Google search for SA uterine anomalies, you will be able to download this PDF. You can print it out and use it in your clinic. When you look at the presentation of congenital uterine anomalies, it remains the fact that they are mostly diagnosed incidentally during investigations for either subfertility recurrent miscarriage or even sometimes menstrual disorder. So depending on what the congenital anomaly is, uh, for example, if there is a congenital uterine anomaly with obstruction, it will typically present as a patient who has relatively young and has recurrent pelvic pain, secondary to a hematometra, hematopompos or endometriosis. Women with urgenesis with the famous MRKH syndrome you know, I think we talk about MRKH syndrome much more often than we actually see the MRKH syndrome. It's a very popular uh, kind of something to talk about. Uh, it, normally, patients will present with either dyspareunia or amenorrhea. And of course, congenital uterine anomalies are one of those boogeymen which have been implicated for just about everything in obstetrics and gynecology. Starting from infertility to recurrent miscarriage to malpresentations and fecal growth restriction. However, the important thing to remember about congenital anomalies is that most women with a congenital uterine anomaly will actually experience a normal reproductive outcome. I'm sure all of us have had this experience where this patient comes to you, she's gone to term, and then when you're doing a cesarean, you find she has a cell. Or she has some kind of a uh, malaria defect like even you know, a unicorn weight uterus, etc. And so most of them actually don't need treatment. It is only in that subset of patients who exhibit problems that treatment is needed. So if you want to make a diagnosis, and since the presentation is covered to talk about diagnosis and management, I'll start with diagnosis. These are all the modalities that are available to you when you want to make a diagnosis. Let me say that Transvaginal ultrasound is probably the gold standard. And now with 3D ultrasound, it has become even more sensitive and even more specific. I never do HSGs in my practice. I mean, I won't say never because you should never say never. But uh, I hardly do HSGs in my practice. Uh, I find that patients are so uncomfortable with HSGs. And I'm sure, again, all of you have had this experience where patients will come and tell you, if you're going to do an HSG, I've undergone one, it was terribly painful, and if you're going to do anything like an HSD, I don't want treatment. And so I have almost stopped doing HSDs, and I'll talk a little bit about the role of CT and MRI. So this was a study which I had performed along with uh, Kedar. By the way, Kedar Danda was uh, my uh, junior in the infertility clinic, and Dr. Nehru Ansodhya, and we reported this in the Indian Journal. What we did was, we took the patient, we did a transvaginal ultrasound, we followed that uh, with a uh, sonohistrogram, and we followed that with an outpatient hysteroscopy, all in the same setting. So we know that there were no biases, and the same person, either me or Kedar, did all three procedures on the same patient in the same setting. And the purpose of this was to compare how good transvaginal ultrasound was in picking up congenital anatomy. This was at Badia Hospital. We didn't, of course, have a 3D machine. So all these patients were done or scanned with a 2D machine. And you can see there that actually the abnormalities which were missed on TBS and seen on outpatient hysteroscopies were first of all extremely few. And whether those had actually any implications on fertility or not was questionable. So this sort of agrees with Adam Negosh's data 
when we reported that almost 50 percent of women who present for infertility have some abnormal finding in the uterus. And if we accept that transvaginal ultrasound and imaging of the uterus is actually quite crucial, it's very important to know how to do this transvaginal ultrasound. If you are still not doing your own TDSs, I would strongly urge you to start doing TDSs on your own. The trick really is that when you enter the vagina with the probe, the probe must be on. This is the most common mistake I have found when I have been teaching TBS to so many gynecologists. If you keep the probe off, go all the way in and then try to find the cervix, it actually becomes quite difficult to find the cervix. So keep the probe on, gently put the probe into the vagina and as you approach the cervix, you will see the cervix right in front of you. Once you see the cervix, you scan the uterus from top to bottom and you essentially look at whether both the walls are of equal dimensions or not. Then you look at the endometrial cavity, you turn the probe and then again do a sweep from top to bottom, again looking at whether the cavity remains centrally placed and single. This is the most easy way to do a transvaginal ultrasound of the uterus and you will be quite easily able to diagnose. All these images are images which I have taken uh, over the years. Normally, to be ultrasound is good enough to make almost a complete diagnosis. Very rarely, you will need either to do a solo histogram, but now with 3D, I hardly do this. That clip is actually from my 1998 study in Vardia Hospital. So it's a fairly old clip. But you can see quite easily how the two endometrial cavities are seen once you infuse saline. And when I turn the probe to get a coronal view, you will actually see that you can see the entire fundus. And you should be able to see that now, right? So you can see both the endometrial cavities there filled with uh, bubbles. And you can see a single fundus. So that's a very clear diagnosis even on duty ultrasound of a uterine septum. MRI is usually not recommended or I could say not required for your regular diagnosis of congenital uterine anomalies. It's only useful when there are complex congenital anomalies. What has made a real difference is trans, uh, 3D transvaginal ultrasound. And you can see those beautiful images there. You look at the notch of the uterus and you see the major thing in diagnosis is that even if you think there are two uterine cavities, the question is, is there a single fundus or there are two fundi? Because if there is a single fundus, it's a septum and you can go ahead and treat it. If there are two separate fundi and you try to cut from below, because from below both will appear more or less similar. If you try to cut, you will perforate the uterus. So that is the crucial thing you have to differentiate. And in fact, previously we actually used to do laparoscopies to make this distinction between a single fundus and two fundi. We don't do that anymore because now we have 3D ultrasound. And always remember that owing to the association between congenital uterine anomalies and renal tract, we should always do an ultrasound abdominal illness for all these patients where you have either suspected or made a diagnosis of congenital uterine anomalies. Do congenital uterine anomalies then be managed? As I already said, most of them will actually have normal reproductive outcomes. However, occasionally unification defects uh, may give an increased risk of first trimester miscarriage, fetal birth and fetal malpresentations. But what is really very important for management is the uterine septum. To be really very honest, if I have a patient of recurrent pregnancy loss and I see a septum, I'm very happy. Because at least I can tell the patient that the issue is the same way. Otherwise, in most patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, you are at a loss. I excuse the pun. Uh, to tell the patient why exactly she had uh, this problem. And there is excellent evidence to show that if you treat a uterine septum, your outcomes in recurrent pregnancy loss improve considerably. If you look at uh, the guidelines, they all seem to suggest that if the patient has presented with infertility and has a septum, you should not cut that septum. 
I don't understand the logic of that. I mean, you don't know which sector will produce a recurrent pregnancy loss or not. And over here, I diverge a little bit from evidence. And if I see a sector even in a patient with infertility, I tend to cut that sector because why should I wait for that patient to have one, two, or even three abortions? And then when I've actually made a diagnosis and the procedure that will take care of the problem is a very low morbidity procedure. Of course, abdominal or laparoscopic metroplasty for fusion or unification is generally not advisable. And I think, you know, sometimes we tend to get a little carried away uh, with all the wonderful videos that we see, but the fact of the matter is that this is not really an operation which seems to be absolutely required. Uh, the story of management of congenital uterine anomalies does not end with treating the anomaly. It continues to pregnancy because these women have a higher risk of preterm labor. So it is quite essential that you do your 16 week scan, look at the cervical length, etc., and offer surplus to select the number of patients. If you look at data on uterine transplant in the literature, you will find that it is still regarded as a fairly experimental procedure. So this is not something which you should consider doing on a routine basis, even when there is a genesis of the uterine cavity. We'll talk a little bit now about the uterine septum and the surgery of uterine septum. And the first question we need to answer is, do all septae need to be incised? The answer is that if the septum is more than a centimeter, and if that patient has had either infertility or recurrent pregnancy loss, then those are the septae that you should incise. Is there any need for doing an ultrasound-guided septal incision? There is absolutely not. There is no need for doing a laparoscopic guided also because both ultrasound guided and laparoscopic guidance will only help you to make an early diagnosis of perforation. It will not help you to decide how much septum to cut. It will not help you to uh, do anything uh, to prevent a perforation and therefore there is no need to use any of those things. Uh, should you use a scissor, cautery or laser? When I started doing uh, septum incisions in 96, I think, uh, we were using scissors at that time, but it was very cumbersome. The scissors used to get blunt all the time and then once actually the blade of the scissor broke because it was a septum like the one which is being cut on top over there. Very long and very broad kind of septum. So then we switched on to the cautery. The fear is that if you use cautery, you will provoke adhesions in the uterine cavity. But remember that when you are cutting a septum, you are essentially cutting an avascular tissue. And if you remain in the center, you will see that as you cut the septum, the septum actually seems to recede. And therefore, we never say that we are excising the septum. We are incising the septum, and because the septum is actually an inherent part of the uterine wall, it simply moves into the cavity, and you probably will not even be able to make out if you do a repeat hysteroscopy after some time whether there was a septum or not. Once uh, the septum has been cut, and when you cut the septum, I prefer to use a pure cutting current. We use short, sharp strokes and always keep the ostium in view because that is the way you will know how much you have to cut. If you start seeing bleeding when you are cutting a septum, you are obviously gone either too deep or you have gone too up or too low. And you should stop right there and reassess your entire uterine cavity. Once the septum is cut, it's a good idea to give the patient two cycles of estradiol and progesterone. Uh, we normally use two milligram TDS for 25 days. In the last 10 days, we add progesterone before we tell the patient that she is now all right to conceive. For septum adhesions, I have not felt the need to put in an IV uh, because remember that what you're cutting is avascular and it's not really going to result in the Ashenel syndrome. As I said, we give the treatment for two months and then we tell the patient that you can now go ahead and conceal. And we always do a scan at 16 weeks for these patients and see the cervical length. If we find that the cervical length is less than 2.5 centimeters, then we offer a surplus. If we find that the cervical length is more than that, the reason I do it at 16 weeks is because I know that at 18 weeks you're going to have an anatomy scan and I can get another assessment on the cervix at that time. So all patients with septum don't really need a cervical surplage. For a very long time, the T-shaped uterus was thought not to be a congenital anomaly. It was thought that it's probably because of DES exposure 
to female fetuses in utero. We now know, however, that T-shaped uteri can exist either as a congenital anomaly or even because of tuberculosis. In urban areas particularly, the incidence of tuberculosis is going down, but in rural areas it is still quite prevalent. And the problem with T-shaped uteri is that they have really terrible outcomes. The highest rate of first trimester abortions and in some small series, not even a single patient conceiving even after IVF treatment. So again, when I started treating T-shaped uteri, uh, you know, quite some quite some years back, uh, we used to cut with the scissor. The problem was getting the angle of the scissor right because you are cutting on the lateral wall, and when you are cutting on the lateral wall, you need to turn your scope quite a bit. So then we started cutting uh, using the Collins knife with a pure cutting current. You will see at the bottom. And that on top is how a T-shaped uterus should look like. It's a very narrow, you can see that cavity now? It's a very narrow cylindrical cavity. You cannot see any part of the cornu from the midpoint of the uteri cavity. And that is a T-shaped cavity. Uh, cavity where you can see bits of the cornu from the midpoint of the uterus is not a T-shaped uterus. That's an arcuate uterus and that uterus does not need to be cut should be treated even when patients present with uh, primary infertility? The answer is in my practice, I do. Uh, Post-op treatment remains the same. I don't put uh, IUD in these patients also. The only place where I put an IUD after operative hysteroscopy is in patients where I have treated them for Ashenan syndrome. A question which is often asked is, aren't you worried about puncturing the uterine artery? After all, you are cutting on the lateral wall of the uterine. And the answer to that really is that if it is a true T-shaped uterus, then the distance between the endometrial cavity and the uterine is considerably more than it would be in a normal uterus. And therefore, if you want to be safe when you are cutting the lateral walls of a T-shaped uterus, you have to make sure it is indeed T-shaped because that's what adds to the safety. So the outcomes in literature with cutting a T-shaped uterus can be uniformly good. Now mind you, let me reiterate this and I will present other experience here. From the fertility related endoscopic procedures between 2001 and 2004, this whole data, I don't have more recent data, you will see that we did only 58 lateral wall metroplasties. Now this is from a fairly large cohort of infertility patients and the point I'm trying to make here is that a T-shaped lateral wall metroplasty is not a procedure which you should be doing very often. In fact, it is a procedure which should come across uh, your operation theater not very commonly. And you will see that we had fairly good outcomes for these patients. Now, this is the big difference between a T-shaped uterus and an arcuate uterus. That's an arcuate uterus. You will see that the cornu is quite large. You will see that the cavity is quite capacious. And from the midpoint of the uterine cavity, you will see bits of the cornu. This is not a uterus which needs to be cut. This is simply an arcuate uterus, a physiological variation in the shape of the uterine cavity. Making lateral cuts over here will only do damage to the uterus. So let me end by saying that just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should. Ability doesn't mean prerogative. And that really is so important when you're dealing with uterine anatomy. That patient with uh, septomax cesarean that I was referring to, after the cesarean, you don't need to call her back and cut her septum. She has already delivered. So there has to be some kind of a rationale when you are looking at congenital uterine anatomy. And like Winston Churchill said in the story of the Malakand Field Force, I passed with relief from the tossing sea of cause and theory to the firm ground of result and fact. So congratulations again to the Nagpur Society, Anka, Ashish, Pravati, the entire team for putting together a conference like this because conferences like this actually, as Winston Churchill said, help you to pass with relief from cause and theory to result and fact. Uh, let me again end by reiterating my request to support me as I stand for the president. I have a website, it's called isupportjaydikan.com. I believe it's the first time a website has been set up for a Foxy election. And if you scan that QR code with your mobile phones, it will take you to the website. Once you are on the website, you could register your support for me. And I'm delighted, humbled and honored, thank you. Humbled and honored to share that literally thousands of Foxians have already registered their support for me.
Uh, there is a video blog section on the website. I speak a lot. My wife doesn't think so, but I do speak quite a lot. I've spoken in more than 800 webinars since the lockdown began. And a lot of my uh, talks are there in that video blog section. I have also read a lot of series, O2, SG2, by Bara, and all the videos are available there. Or of course, you could choose to join a Telegram channel either by scanning that QR code or clicking on that link. And whenever I speak in a webinar, I update that. Thank you very much again, Dr. Lakshmi Shikhande, Dr. Manama Madam. Uh, thank you again to the Nagpur Society for having me. Please join on the stage to felicitate Dr. Jaydeep sir. 